Excellencies and shipmates, at this Arctic Circle Assembly, we are, of, after all, in one ship. <clears throat> it is indeed a proud privilege for us to be given this opportunity to present India's Arctic policy, building a partnership for sustainable development to this August gathering. Our Arctic policy was released by the Honorable Minister of Earth Sciences, Dr. Jitendra Singh, earlier this year on 17th March 22. Uh, after I finish speaking, my colleague uh, will be speaking on the science element of this. <clears throat> the orig origins of our engagement dates back to 1920 when we signed the Svalbard Treaty in Paris. Since then, we have signif significantly increased our engagement with the Arctic, the details of which will be elaborated in this presentation. Our Arctic policy rests on six pillars. These are science and research, climate and environmental protection, economic and human development, transportation and connectivity, governance and international cooperation, and national capacity building. The policy has been crafted after intensive consultations with all stakeholders, and the objectives contained in these six pillars are in consonance with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We believe that these goals form the foundation of our engagement with the Arctic region. Science and research is at the forefront of our engagement with the Arctic. Our, our research station at Himadri in New Orisund in Svalbard was set up in 2008 and is currently manned for about 180 days in a year. We have so far taken 14 expeditions, the first one being in 2007. We have also set up a multi-sensory mood, uh, mood observatory in Kongsfjordon in 2014 and an atmospheric laboratory in, in Gruva Badet in 2016. Our scientists visited the North Pole for the first time earlier this year as part of a Norwegian expedition. Going ahead, we intend to strengthen our research activities at Himadri by maintaining a continuous presence throughout the year. We also look forward to enhancing our collaboration with international partners in multidisciplinary research projects. We are also in the process of acquiring a dedicated ice class polar research vessel to increase our capacity and look forward to collaboration in this space. Space-enabled resources also play a significant role in sustainable development of the Arctic region. Indian Space Research Organization runs a highly developed space program. <laughs> Existing Indian capabilities such as ResourceSat and planned miss missions such as the NASA ISRO SARSAT, um, which is a collaborative effort between ISRO and NASA, could be utilized for the larger benefit of the Arctic region. Moving on to the second pillar. All of us are impacted by the severe consequences of climate change. It consistently reminds us of the criticality of respecting the environment and urgency of finding collaborative solutions to issues that are essentially transnational in their character. The photograph on the left is an ice stupa, and I could speak about this in greater detail during the Q&A session. We believe that the UN Sustainable Development Goals form the foundation for engagement with the Arctic. I would like to mention that globally, India ranks third in renewable power, fourth in wind power, and fifth in solar power. We look forward to engage with partners to research on efficient climate and environmental modeling, preservation of fragile ecosystems, and leveraging traditional knowledge systems to preserve biodiversity and contain the effects of climate change. Insofar as economic and human development is concerned, there is commonality in the living conditions of the indigenous people of the Himalayas and those of the Arctic. We follow ancient practices of traditional medicine and lifestyle systems such as Ayurveda, yoga, and naturopathy, amongst others which will find equal resonance in the Arctic. The ancient Indian practice of yoga has been recognized by the United Nations as, <clears throat> uh, uh, and the summer solstice every year, that is the 21st of June, is globally celebrated as the International Yoga Day. In a pioneering endeavor this year, the International Yoga Day celebrations were extended to the Arctic and the Antarctic regions. We aim to partner and collaborate with various stakeholders for responsible economic activity in the region with the highest regard to the fragile ecosystem as well as the socioeconomic needs of, of the communities in the region. Towards this end, the Arctic Economic Council will be our key partner. We also aim to contribute towards food security through fail-safe seed storage in the region. As brought out earlier, our communities in the glacial Himalayan regions share similar living conditions as those faced by the 400,000 indigenous people of the Arctic. We would be glad to share best practices for the mutual benefit of these communi uh, uh, communities through cultural as well as educational exchanges. 
Insofar as transportation and connectivity is concerned, we rank third globally in terms of providing seafarers to the world and cater to almost 10% of global demand. Our seafarers have contributed towards the resilience of the global supply system during the COVID-19 pandemic. As new shipping routes open up in the Arctic, there would be growing requirements of manpower in different sectors of this domain. With your support, we could skill our mariners to operate in the region, thereby contributing towards fulfilling the human resource requirement of the region. We look forward to partner in the growth of sustainable, robust, and resilient infrastructure to cater for the requirements of transportation and connectivity. We would like to partner in the design, development, and construction of ICE-class vessels. We also seek partners to strengthen north-south connectivity, as this has the potential to significantly lower shipping costs, which would be immensely beneficial to the region. With regards to governance and international cooperation, we have ratified nearly all relevant international treaties and strongly support a rule-based international order in the region. We aim to promote peace, stability, and security within the framework of, of existing international laws and regulations, maintain a strong focus on preservation of the environment, and the sustainable economic, socio-economic development of the region. We also aim to enhance our understanding of regulations and legislations at the regional, national, and subnational levels. Coming to our final uh, pillar of national capacity building, our lead agency in this effort is the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, the NCPR at Goa, under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. It is the spear a spearhead of India's nat national polar research program and includes Arctic and Antarctic studies. Many universities in India are also introducing credit-based courses in Arctic studies from a scientific, scientific as well as so social perspective as part of their curriculum. Going forward, we will enhance our capabilities and augment our capacities in engaging the Arctic over a wide spectrum ranging from science and exploration to seafaring and responsible economic cooperation. Our philosophy of Atmanirbhar Bharat or self-reliant India will be the foundation of this effort. We will partner with UArctic and other institutions of repute in the Arctic region in this initiative. No policy is complete without a robust monitoring and implementation mechanism. Our policy would be implemented through a comprehensive action plan drawn up and reviewed by a multi-agency empowered Arctic policy group headed by the Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Dr. Ravi Chandran, who is going to be speaking next. The mechanism involves multiple stakeholders from government, the science and the research community, academia, business and industry. To conclude, I would like to reiterate that the underlying theme of our engagement with the Arctic is sustainability. A collaborative approach in dealing with transnational challenges is not new to us and is captured in the ancient Indian philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is but one family. Our concern for sustainable development has been articulated by the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, who stated that the earth, the air, the land, and the water are not an inheritance from our forefathers, but on loan from our children. So we have to hand over to them at least what was handed over to us. Our Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, reiterated this uh, approach when he proposed the One Word Movement in COP26 in Glasgow, that being life, lifestyle for environment. He stated that today, the world admits that lifestyle has a big role in climate change. So I propose before you a One Word Movement, that being life, L-I-F-E, which means lifestyle for environment. What is needed today is mindful and deliberate utilization instead of mindless and destructive consumption. Finally, I end by thanking you for giving me a patient listening. We look forward to collaborating with you in every which way we can, and we'll be glad to receive any suggestions or recommendations that you might have. Our point of contact for this purpose will be my colleague, Mr. Dhawal Lakhani, who can be contacted on the email ID as mentioned on this slide. With that, I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ravi Chandra.